So welcome everyone to the class, The Buddhist Path of Awakening. And let's bow in. Tonight is a little bit unusual. Um, the subject is chance. Um, there were several requests for this. And um, so we're going to discuss chants and see if we can understand better what they are and why we do them. Initially, um, when I began preparing this talk, I thought I would talk a bit about the protector chants uh, because they're the most difficult to get your arms around. But uh, then I realized we're not doing the protector chants yet. And um, so instead, we're going to be discussing the chants that we do do uh, morning and evening. There are two main aspects uh, to these chants. One is that they are objects of awareness, meditation. We bring our mind, our minds back from dream into awareness of these sounds as they come out of our mouths. In that regard, it really doesn't matter what you're saying. You could be just being aware of this, these sounds. Or as Trimba Rinpoche once said, you could be saying Mickey Mouse. Um, and still, they do serve that function of being an object of meditative awareness. And so, when we do the chants, we want to be here with the sound of the chants. The second aspect is obvious, which is that they carry intellectual content. And so they're teachings to us as well, to some degree. And um, the your attitude as you listen to the chants is a mix of coming back to awareness and also understanding and I know you could even be contemplating the meaning of the chants. Up to you. The chants also express the two main aspects of the path. There are at least two. Um, the path and the teachings describe, on the one hand, how to be how to be a human being in this world, in this life, in a way that is healthy, sane, awake, and to some degree happy. At the same time, the chants also describe what the world looks like as we, our minds change. Because as we become saner on the path, the world transforms. In the beginning, when we come to the path, we regard the world to some degree, each one of us differently, as a veil of tears, as a source of unhappiness and suffering. But what the chants are also telling us and describing for us is that there is a different way to see the world. We can see it as fundamentally good, that our lives and the world of which we're a part are fundamentally valuable for no reason at all. Things are fundamentally of worth, not in terms of what they can do for us or to us, but just inherently and of themselves valuable. In the Shambhala teachings, this idea is called basic goodness, that the whole world, including each one of us, is suffused with basic goodness, that it's basically wholesome, healthy, beautiful even. Even in its ugliness, it's beautiful because it's so vivid and meaningful, not meaningful in the sense of taking us to some goal, 
but meaningful in its own right, that the quality of water is so watery, the quality of a mountain is so solid, the quality of air moves so beautifully. And so the chants are really about transforming how we be and how we see the world. Ultimately, the most common description of the world is that as it arises in this present moment, it's empty, empty of any own being, empty of any existence that we might think of. Because as things arise in the present moment, they are already leaving. Just like this gesture, like these words, like the sensation of your bottom on your chair or cushion, as I mention it, suddenly it comes to you and now it'll be gone in a minute, that sensation. All of these experiences, the experiences of the five senses and of mind, thoughts and emotions, arise and pass away in the present moment, like images on a computer screen, like movies, like, or the anal typical analogies, the usual analogies are like images in a mirror, reflections on water, um, mirages in the desert. The whole world is constantly arising and passing away that way in the present moment. The past and the future are just ideas, concepts, and they, they have no reality. They're dreams. And so the chants describe this world as it really is, not as we hope or fear it to be, but this beautiful arising presentation, vivid and yet empty. Empty of what? Empty of any true existence. Empty of any duration over time, because time is just a myth. Empty of any unitary existence, because everything arises, just like the image you're looking in your, on your computer screen, everything arises in dependence on everything else. It's all a part of a matrix. This world, this idea, the, this kind of world, this vivid world, it's called basic goodness in the Shambhala teachings. In the Buddhist, especially the Vajrayana teachings, it's called sacred world. Normally, we walk through this world and we see it as a veil of tears, as a, 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 an environment of suffering. And what the teachings are asking us to do is to change ourselves and to change and when you change yourself you change the world and to see it as being fundamentally sacred worth being here for for more than worth being here for full of meaning in the moment not meaning like it's going to tell you how to get enlightened or how to make a lot of money or you know give you some message it's meaningful because it communicates itself so vividly In the Shambhala teachings, this is also called Great Eastern Sun. It's the idea that the sun is rising continually. It's always rising. The world is always new, always fresh in this present moment. One of the main issues and difficulties with the chants is the issue of duality versus non-duality. We all believe that we, this is why we're unenlightened, um, feel that we have true existence. Likewise, we feel that others out there exist truly, and that we're in this constantly um, bipolar relationship. Two poles, me and other. In those relationships, there are three main possibilities. If you see something as friendly to your existence, as augmenting your existence, you want to draw it to you. This is called passion, desire. 
If you see something as dangerous, as inimical, as threatening to your well-being and continued existence, you want to push it away. That's called hatred in the teachings. And if you see the other as indifferent, neither for you nor against you, that's called indifference or stupidity. These are the three poisons, and they are the three main drivers of unenlightened neurotic mind. These chants are imploring us, teaching us, directing us to see the world as non-dual. What that means is that everything that arises is arising in this present moment. It doesn't belong to me. It's not in relationship to me. It's just arising. This includes your thoughts, your emotions, as well as every sense um, appearance that appears to you. But it's a very hard thing to get your mind into, especially beginning in the beginning. This is really what practice is all about, what meditation practice is all about, is to come into that clear, open awareness in which things are simply arising, fresh, new, every second, great eastern sun. But we don't see it that way. We see it in terms of the three poisons. We were in bi these, this polar relationship in which things are for us, against us, or neutral. And so the chants are couched in these dualistic terms. In fact, language itself is dualistic. It's all about I and that, I and other, this and that, as though things had real existence. And so the chants are written in that kind of language because they have to be. And yet what they're leading us toward is something very different. So there's a slogan that um, when you get to the Vajrayana and you're maybe you're receiving teachings or you're starting a practice and there are a lot of preliminary little practices that one begins with, and there is a slogan that I have always liked. It says, things do not exist, and yet they appear. They appear, and yet they do not exist. That means that they have no own being of their own. They're just this constant display, like this gesture, appearing and disappearing, like these words coming out, they are born and they are dying as they appear. So that slogan is, things do not exist, and yet they appear. They appear, and yet they do not exist. Miraculous. So let's go through, I decided what we're going to do, at least today, is not do any of the protector chants, but we're going to talk about the chants that we do. And um, I'm going to experiment here with a uh, not screen sharing. I'd like to actually give you some pictures. Um, I tried to find good pictures. Trouble is, I've moved, and most of my possessions are in boxes. And um, but I did come up with some terrific pictures. I think of Padmasambhava, and I'm going to share them. Uh, actually, I'm not going to share them. I'm going to give them to you in chat. And they are in chat. Can anyone see these? There are um, four pictures. IMG underscore 0267.heic. If you look in chat. Not yet. They're not there. All right. Nothing's in chat. Huh? huh? There's, there's nothing in chat yet. Okay, I'm going to try. I, I put them in there before we started, and that's probably the problem. Now, I'm not sure how to get them to show up for you. I'm seeing them. Um, yeah, we only see what's in chat since each each person joined. Right. Um, 
Okay, well, then I'm going to get them again in chat. We can also just screen share. Why don't we do that? We'll just screen share when we get to them. Okay. Um, we're going to start with probably one of the most difficult chants, um, which is the first one we do in the morning or in the evening. The Four Dharmas of Gampopa. Now, somewhere in, in, in the course of going through this second volume of the Profound Treasury, we're going to take a little sidetrack and go through um, some biographies of the lineage figures. And um, because it's very important to me, the chants that we're doing, a lot of them are, well, all of them are pretty much about the lineage in one degree or another. And <clears throat> Gampopa was a very important person in the lineage. Now, in Tibetan Buddhism, there are four main sects of Tibetan Buddhism. The oldest, um, and it uh, originated in the 8th century with Padmasambhava, who we're going to be talking about tonight, um, is the Nyingma sect. It literally means, Nyingma means old ones in Tibetan. And it's N-Y-I-N-G-M-A, Nyingma. And um, then that was in the 700s. In the 900s, there was an evil king who came to the throne. For the Jews among us, he was kind of the Haman of Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, he uh, suppressed Buddhism. And he, uh, until he was uh, slain, assassinated by a crazy uh, wild Tibetan yogi monk, uh, yet went on a monk, a yogi, um, and was a great hero. And uh, then again, Buddhism started coming back. And in the 11th century, a number of Tibetans went to India and brought back the Buddhist teachings. And especially in these, this is the origin of both the Kagyu sect, of which we're part, and the Sakya sect, of which we're not a part. And then in the 14th century, there arose the last of the four sects, the Golukpa sect. The Dalai Lama is Golukpa. Um, the way that the Kagyu sect, which is our sect, arose, also we're also Nyingma, because Trungpa Rinpoche, who is the person that a number of us are students of, tonight Peter and Tony and some other people here knew him. Um, him. Many of his teachers were Nyingma, and the Nyingmas and the Kagyus were very close. Kagyu, by the way, literally means the, Gyu means lineage, and Ka means word. It's the word lineage, meaning that this is the sect in which the teachings are passed down by word from teacher to student. And so it's the transmission of the word, the lineage of the word. The Kagyu sect arose when Marpa, the translator, went to India in the early 1100s, no, mid 1000s, excuse me, mid 1000s, and um, received teachings from the great Siddha Naropa and brought them back to Tibet. His idea was that this was going to be a great living. He was going to get teachings, come back, give them, and people would pay him. He didn't count on getting enlightened, but he did. <laughs> and, and he became somewhat more genuine uh, than he originally was when he went to India. And he had many adventures, and uh, he went actually made three trips, if you can imagine, making three trips in the 11th century across the Himalayas into northern India and back. Wow. Talk about an adventure. And he was a farmer, and he had a wife and children, and he collected disciples. And his most famous disciple, and sort of the second figure, um, well, the first figure in the Kagyu lineage, the first two figures, are the Indian teachers in this lineage that Marpa uh, received teachings from. The first was a man named Tilopa, who was a wild yogi. He um, he was a uh, Mahasiddha, that means he was, had terrific powers. He wandered um, all over India as a beggar most of the time. He was sometimes he was a pimp. Um, he ate the rotten fish 
that fishermen threw away uh, because they were too rotten, they couldn't sell them. And he, and when you see a tonka of Tilopa, he's holding a fish. And there's a famous story about him that one day someone said, you shouldn't be eating fish, they're sentient beings, you know? You should be vegetarian. And he took this fish and he said, oh, really? And it was a dead fish. And he brought it back to life, threw it into the air, and it swam away in the water. <laughs> this is Tilopa. And he's the first figure in the lineage. Actually, the very first figure in the lineage, when we, because we're going to come to the chant, is Vajradhara, who is a primordial Buddha, not a human being. And Tilopa received teachings from Vajradhara. And then Naropa was Tilopa's student. There are stories about him. And Marpa was his student. So Marpa's famous student, um, most famous student, was Milarepa. And Milarepa was a yogi who lived in caves, ultimately, for most of the rest of his life after he received teachings from Marpa. And his main student was a man named Gampopa. Gampopa um, was one of the very first monastics in Tibet. An Indian teacher came to Tibet. I won't give you too many names. He brought monasticism and transmitted it. And Gampopa was one of his foremost students. And Gampopa um, founded a particular monastic order. And then Gampopa heard about this wild yogi living in a cave, Milarepa. And he went to study with him and he received the teachings and became Milarepa's foremost disciple. And there's a famous story that I, that I love. I mean, there's many stories, so many stories. I mean, Milarepa, that's how he taught. He told stories. And there is a book called The Hundred Thousand Songs of Milarepa, um, which you can buy. And they're not literally a hundred thousand, but they're called songs because he sang his teachings. There was a long tradition of teachers singing their teachings and Milarepa sang his. And they're in the forms often mostly of stories. And they're called a hundred thousand because uh, in Tibet, if you wanted to say it was a big number, you always call it a hundred thousand. A boom, it's called. In the, the Chinese language does the same thing. If you want to talk about a, a big number, it's 10,000. The journey of 10,000 li is begun with but a single step. You might have heard that slogan. So the 100,000 songs of Milarepa. And at one point, Gampopa was a student and he asked him, he said, what is the secret of your success, of your enlightenment? And Milarepa, who was standing there in a, ro in a robe, you know, this yogi in a cave, turns around, lifts up his robe, exposing his ass, and shows Gampopa calluses on his buttocks. <laughs> That's the story. <laughs> so Gampopa, um, established the monastic order, which really became the Kagyu sect, our sect. And we chant, the first thing we chant in the morning are the four dharmas of Gampopa. And these are very difficult in a way to understand because they're attempting in dualistic language. All language is dualistic. It's dualistic because it assumes that there are things that move which is a contradiction in term. If you've got this thing that you can define, it's unmoving. And then it moves and it becomes something else as soon as it's moving. So motion, verbing, and nouns are have contradictory logic. And yet this is the way language is constructed. And so the four dharmas of Gampopa go, grant your blessings. Now here's the very beginning. We're asking someone to grant their blessings. Gampopa, what we're really doing, and this is, you have to really un believe this, understand this, is we are rousing our own wisdom, our own Buddha nature, which is there in us already. It's just covered over. They, and the analogies for this are often, there are, there are many, but one is a beggar who's living in a hovel with a dirt floor in utter poverty, unaware that buried under the floor is a treasure. This is the analogy for unenlightened people and their Buddha nature, all of us, that we're just unaware that it's there. And so 
when we implore someone else, an external being, could be a human being, could be a deity, to give us blessings, what we're really doing is arousing the blessings that are already there for us. We are trying to open our mind, open our eyes and our heart and our ears and all of it to these blessings that are here now in, the, in us and in the world, both inside us and in the, the world that arises around us. If we could only open our eyes and appreciate it as being sacred, truly sacred. So we start out with the four dharmas of Gampopa. Grant your blessings, as though we're talking to Gampopa, so that my mind may be one with the Dharma, meaning I really understand the teachings, that the teachings are alive in this sentient being, in this person. Grant your blessings so that Dharma may progress along the path. It's impersonal. It's not me. I'm not going to get this, I, 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 this, this self that wants to self-aggrandize. Rather, what we're doing, if we make progress on the path, we are losing that sense of I. We're coming completely present. And I, ego, is dissolving because it's unnecessary. It's an extra comment. It's an extra little side step. But when we're totally here, 100% present, I dissolves. There's no need for it, no room for it. So the Dharma progresses along the path. Grant your blessings so that my mind may be one with the Dharma. Grant your blessings so that Dharma may progress along the path. Grant your blessings so that the path may clarify confusion. Grant your blessings so that confusion may dawn as wisdom. And what all that is saying is that when we become completely awake, aware, we're not lost in dream, we can see thoughts and emotions arising and passing away like a person sitting on a train watching the scenery go by the window and that's what those last two stanzas mean grant your blessings so that my mind may be one with the dharma grant your blessings so that dharma may progress along the path grant your blessings so that the path may clarify confusion clarify means we wake up from the dream we come back into awareness Grant your blessings so that confusion may dawn as wisdom. The most confused thought, I hate that son of a bitch, or I'm terribly unhappy, or I want um, some, I, I want a million dollars. And we can just see those thoughts and they become expressions of our awareness and our egolessness rather than expressions of the desire of me. Now, when you do this kind of a chant, it's both an object of awareness, the words themselves, and it's a teaching. And it's up to you how you want to take it as you do it. One more, one second. I want to print this just to make sure because Sometimes I'll forget something. Now, I also want to say something about deities. I thought I was going to do a, 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 a talk on the protectors. Um, I'm going to share a screen and show you a protector that I was going to talk about. Excuse me for the printer. <laughs> How's that for one? This is Ekajati. Um, she is a protector, one of quite a few. She's got a single eye here. Um, she's got a crown of skulls. The Her skulls, skull crown represents the five um, Clashes, defilements, and she wears them as ornament. She has no, no normal eyes. She has flames for normal eyes. She has a single fang, which you can see going down here. If, she, if we were seeing her whole body, she has a single breast. 
And there's a whole description of what, what, what of her and why what she's about. She is the protector of the very, very highest teachings in all of Buddhism, the Dzogchen teachings, the great perfection teachings. And she is the perfecter. These teachings were contained in 17, sometimes they're called 18 tantras. Tantras are texts um, which are very, very concise, very um, hard to understand. You need a teacher to explain them. And they're very, very deep. And there were 17, uh, sometimes 18 uh, great perfection tantras. She is the keeper of those tantras. So I just want to give you an idea. I mean, when we work with something like this in a chant, we are working with our own inner potential, our nature. On the other hand, um, someone once asked Trungpa Rinpoche, are these figures like Ekajati here real? His response was, as real as you. <laughs> now you can take that one of two ways. You can take that or both. You can take it as meaning she's as real as you. You can meet her coming down the street, you know, if you got the right circumstances. The other way to take it is you're not real any more than she is. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. Um, The um, next chant is really the one that I have the most affection for of all of these, or most interest in t talking about this morning. And that's the what's called the seven lines supplication to Padmakara. And I want to show you some pictures of Padmakara. Padmakara, um, first of all, he was he lived in the eighth century. Um, the way it went was that um, in the seventh century, a king of Tibet named Songsa, named, uh, um, what was his name? Um, I'm forgetting his name. Anyhow, he had a Chinese wife who brought Buddhism to him, and he became a Buddhist, but he really didn't propagate it. Um, then about 100 years later, another king also, well, he had 18 wives, actually, and he, one, a number of his wives converted him profoundly into Buddhism. His name was Trisong Detson. And he invited teachers from India to come and bring Buddhism to Tibet. And they came, especially one uh, came from uh, northern India named uh, Shantabrakshita. And he tried to build a monastery in Lhasa. But there was a local religion, you know, a, a native religion, religion native to Tibet called Bun. It's usually spelled P-O with an umlaut, two dots over it, N, and it's pronounced, the P is pronounced like a B, and the O, the umlaut, gives it a sound of almost a U, so it's pronounced Bun. And the Bun religion had a lot of figures like Ekajati uh, in it, and by day, um, Shantarakshita and his monks would build this monastery in Lhasa, and by night, the local deities would tear it down. So Shantarakshita went to Trisong Detson, the king, and said, look, you need somebody who's got more mojo than me. And there's this fellow in India uh, that you should invite to come here, and he'll, he'll do it. His name is Padmasambhava. And so the king invited Padmasambhava, sent messengers, and Padmasambhava agreed to come. And he came and he, he con not only did he conquer the local deities, he turned them into protectors of the Dharma, of the teachings, converted them into Buddhism. And his name, Pamasambhava, literally means born on a lotus. Let's look at a picture. Uh, I'm going to try and find this picture. Oh, here's one. This is a good one. This is actually from my shrine. This is a statue. There are eight traditional representations of Padmasambhava. Can you see that? Peter looks like he's squinting. Yep. And they're what are called the eight aspects of Padmasambhava. This is the most common one. He's uh, seated more or less cross-legged, and he's got a trident, a, a trishula, it's called. 
He's got a Vajra in one hand and a skull cup full of Amrita. Amrita is the elixir of life in another. And this is the most famous image of Padmasambhava. This is a little statue. He had, here's another one though, that for your amusement. Um, let me. I hope I'm going to get this up. Oh, yeah. Can you see that? Uh, or do I need to? Yes, no? No, the Pimakara. Yes. Just the original. Just the statue. Here is, this is about, about the same guy. There we go. There we go. Uh, he's in his wrathful aspect. Um, when he, on his way to Tibet with his consort, Princess Mandarava, he had many consorts. This is she, here she's a tiger. And she has the jaws, she has the corpse of ego, Rudra, in her jaws. And she's going with him. She became a great teacher, as did all of his consorts. And you can see he's in flames, he's wrathful because he's ready to do battle with the forces of neurosis. <laughs> Oftentimes, wrathful deities are depicted in this, what's called the uh, uh, Nakpa um, style, which is, means black. You can see black background, black skin. And he's got a trishula here. This is a three-bladed knife in his hand, this blue thing, uh, in his left hand on our right side. It's three bladed because it each blade pierces one of those three poisons, it pierces the heart of ego and, and it, it pierces desire, hatred and indifference or stupidity. And in his other hand, his right hand up here in this gold object he's holding is a Dorje, which is the symbol of Vajrayana Buddhism. It was Indra's weapon. Indra was the Hindu god of war and the Dorje was his weapon. It was kind of like Thor's hammer. He would throw it, Indra, at his enemies. And when he did these prongs, you can see that at each end it has three prongs. Those prongs would open and strike the enemy. And then the, the, the Dorje or Vajra, it's called Vajra in Sanskrit, Dorje in, in uh, Tibetan, would return to his hand. And this became the symbol of Vajrayana Buddhism because it is indestructible. That's Indra's weapon. So this is Padmasambhava in his wrathful aspect. And there are um, six others, which I didn't uh, take pictures of. I've got photographs of these, of Tonkas of them. And um, they are all representative of different aspects. In one, he is uh, sort of the Buddha, um, Buddha Shakyamuni, incarnate. Now, about, um, what, about 900 years after the Buddha actually lived, he's assuming the persona of the Buddha. In another aspect, he's just a great teacher. Um, in another aspect, um, he is a great subduer of evil and passions. So he has all these different aspects, and there are many stories. And you can read his biography, which is a very esoteric text. It really needs a teacher, someone who understands it, to explain it to you, because it's written in symbolic language. And all the stories are deeply symbolic. So the seven lines supplication goes hum. Now hum is probably the most important seed syllable. It's a mantra. It is the mantra from which all the teachings arise. Hum. It's used in many contexts. And here, Padmasambhava himself arises from home. Now we're talking to him as though he could do something for us. What he represents, and I, this is absolutely the, the truth, he represents each one of us, our enlightened mind that is here inside of us, ready, waiting to be born. And so you see the story of his life is that he was born fully formed at the age of six or seven, you hear it differently in stories. He, he appeared, he appeared, he wasn't born from a mother and a father. He appears. See, this is symbolic of your Buddha nature. It's already there. 
and he appears fully formed on a lotus growing in a lake in a place called Udiana. The lake is called Donakosha. As far as we can anybody can figure, Udiana is in what is now Afghanistan. There were two main silk routes that went across Central Asia. There was a vast desert between the West and the East called the Taklamakan. One silk route went to the North because nobody wanted to go across that huge desert and the other went to the South. Both of them met in the Swat Valley. It's a valley in what is now Afghanistan. This is probably Udiana where those silk routes met. It's a very magical place, the Swat Valley. Um, there is a mountain there. It's one of the 8,000 meter peaks in the world, like Everest and K2 and, and um, Nanga Parbat. No, it is Nanga Parbat um, and others. And it's called Nanga Parbat. It's unique in that it has the highest vertical rise of any mountain in the world in this valley. If you stand on the floor of the valley, you are looking at it rising 20,000 feet from base to top. I would have never seen it, I'd love to. I had friends who were students of Trimpa Rinpoche, archeologists who used to go over there every summer because this place, it, since it's the Western terminus of the Silk Routes, was an archeolog archeological heaven. Um, they would dig down and they said it was like a layer cake going through different cultures that had been there traveling across the silk routes and left, leaving their remains behind. On the eastern edge of the silk routes, the silk routes met in a western edge of China in a place called Dunhuang. And um, Dunhuang, until the seventh century, housed many Buddhists, Buddhist monks. And they lived in caves in Dunhuang on the western edge of China. And there was no printing press, obviously, at that time. So it was a great act of piety to copy the scriptures. And they, these monks would spend their time copying scriptures on the backs of any kind of writing material that they could get their hands on. And what they got their hands on were things that were brought by the travelers coming across these silk routes. And what they brought were travel diaries, bills of lading, all kinds of, you know, invoices like this. And the monks would take these documents, turn them over, and on their back, they would copy the scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures. In the seventh century, for some reason that I'm, I'm not aware of, these monks, the whole Buddhist community left Dunhuang. And as they left, they sealed these caves hermetically, you know, with mud and rock and stone. In the mid to late 19th century, a French archaeologist named Pelliot discovered them and opened them. And inside he found statues and art and, and these texts. But what the real treasure he found was, was what was on the other side of those texts, because there were bills of lading, travel diaries, invoices, all that written in languages that no one had ever seen before, languages of cultures that had risen and fallen in Central Asia over the centuries. Really extraordinary. And so there, there are still some fragments of language in there that no one has ever been able to translate because there's no key, no Rosetta Stone. So here he is in the northwest of the land of Udiana, in the, in, in the Swat Valley of Afghanistan on this lake, on a blooming lotus flower, you have attained supreme, wondrous Siddhi. Siddhis are powers. That's what Siddhi means. And a person who possesses Siddhi is called a Siddha. So there are two main kinds of Siddhis, mundane and supreme. The supreme Siddhi is, um, I just want to see, I made a note I liked. The Supreme City is enlightened compassion and realization of the true nature of reality. It's enlightenment itself. And the, the two, the, actually there are three main components the way enlightenment is described. One is that you see the world as it truly is and as sacred, as holy, as beautiful. Um, the second is that you have enormous compassion 
born out of your egolessness. And the third is that out of that compassion, you are engaging and interacting. It's like a dance, a play with the world and with everything and anything in it that comes to you. So these three aspects, wisdom, compassion, and skillful means, those are what those three are usually called. So you attain supreme wondrous city. You attain ultimate city is the enlightened mind that has those three aspects. And the mundane city is the ability to do mundane things like make a lot of money, win friends, you know, uh, read minds, maybe tell the future. Um, these are the mundane cities. You are renowned as Padmakara. Padmakara is another version of Padmasambhava. It just means arisen from a lotus. Padma means lotus. Akara, Akara means arisen from, as opposed to Padmasambhava, which means born from a lotus. Basically, they're the same. Surrounded by your retinue of many Dakinis, there are two main energies in the world, feminine and masculine. And they each have three levels of ordinary. Um, there can be human beings who are Dakini or Daka. Daka is the male energy. There can be what was it? Non-human Daka and Dakini. And these um, are spirits. And then there are enlightened. Daka and Dakini. And an enlightened Dakini or Daka can be human or it can be non human. And a male, um, well, the, the Dakinis you see are, are constantly energetic and they are engaging with the world. The male energy is much less energetic, it's more um, cold and logical and uh, has to do with understanding. Um, but Dakini, is all about engaging with the activities of life. So Pabin Zimbabwe was surrounded by a retinue of many Dakinis. He was constantly engaged. We here practice following your example. We means we take his character as, as um, a message for what we can be, what we can become, enlightened, compassionate, skillful in our interactions with the world. Please approach and grant your blessing. And we're really imploring ourselves to arise. Guru Padma Siddhi Hum. This is Padma Sambhava's mantra. It literally means guru. You know what a guru is. Padma Lotus Siddhi Powers Hum. <laughs> arise. This is probably the most chanted chant in all of Tibetan Buddhism. Padmasambhava is the most revered figure by Tibetans um, in Tibetan Buddhism. And his story is wild. <laughs> he came to Tibet and lived there for quite a few years and left his mark all over Tibet. He also had teachings, which he knew were inappropriate for the people of that time. And so he hid them. These are called terma, and terma are hidden teachings. Um, there are two kinds, earth terma, sater they're called, earth terma, uh, which are actual physical objects. They could be a text, it could be a statue, um, it could be anything. And these uh, are hidden, maybe buried in a stream, hidden in the rafters of a house, sometimes buried inside solid rock. Uh, and there are miraculous stories of people reaching into rock and pulling out a text or a statue. And then the other kind are called mind terma. And they are sent like messages across the centuries. And they will be found by a tertan. Tertan is a treasure revealer. And a tertan will either find the physical object, if that's the case, or they receive the mind terma. Trungpa Rinpoche uh, was a Teraton, and he discovered many Terma, and many, many, many of them come from Padmasambhava. Then we do the short refuge in Bodhicitta. And this is a requirement, once especially you enter the Mahayana path, 
your practice is not considered complete unless you begin with refuge and bodhicitta. This is a very short version of that. Um, it's about as short as I've ever seen. And the second line is the refuge. Usually that's done first. Refuge means you take refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma, and the Sangha. And what that means is you're not seeking protection in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, but rather you're taking the Buddha as an example of an ordinary human being like you or me, who trod the path and achieved enlightenment, and that we can each do it. If we take refuge in the second jewel, which is the Dharma, the teachings, as instructing us how to tread the path, which means that we treasure them and we follow them. And taking refuge in the third is the Sangha. That's the community of fellow practitioners in which, as Trungpa Rinpoche said, the Sangha, you, everyone, we walk alone together. That way, if someone trips and stumbles or falls, you can help them up because you're not re relying on them. You're not leaning on them. So from my heart, I take refuge in the three jewels, and we do it in order that all sentient beings may attain Buddhahood. The further we go on the path, and this is really what we're going to be working with in the second volume, and the more we achieve egolessness, as it were, the more we realize that the only thing worth doing is to be of service to others. There's just nothing else. When we begin to lose the ego impulse of self-aggrandizement, what's left is interaction with this world, with other sentient beings, with love, with compassion, with joy, and wanting to help people out of their suffering in every way. And a this is called the act of a bodhisattva. Bodhi means awake, sattva means being. And the bodhisattva is the person who practices this, is the person on the Mahayana path that we're going to be studying. And um, the bodhisattva, their main motivation is to be of service to others. So in order that all sentient beings may attain Buddhahood, there are three ways that a bodhisattva can be of service. The most ordinary, and it's still very valuable, is to help people with their material needs, food, clothing, shelter. The next one up and most more valuable than the first is to help people conquer fear. And the most valuable way that a bodhisattva can help another human being is by helping them to achieve enlightenment, awakening. And so we always begin the practice with this um, vow. There are many longer versions of this, which you will discover. In order that all sentient beings may attain Buddhahood, from my heart, I take refuge in the three jewels. How are we doing on time? 6.30, we're getting late. So I'm going to go rather quickly. Um, the last, well, it's not maybe not the last, but we're going to talk about the supplication to the Dakpo Kagyu. Kagyu is the Kagyu sect, which I've already mentioned. Dakpo is the region where Gampopa lived. So this is the Dakpo Kagyu. There were Kagyu manifestations of the Kagyu sect in other regions, and they are called by different names. And this is the lineage chant. Now, the more you tread the path, the more you begin to appreciate the lineage because the lives and the words of the lineage figures are teachings because these people were human beings like you and me and very colorful and because you begin to develop an affection for their eccentricities you know Milarepa showing his calloused ass and there are all these wonderful stories <coughs> Tibetans are very colorful people by the way we chant this in monosyllables that's not done by Tibetans. Tibetans would chant this in a song, you know, with a tune. Trungpa Rinpoche um, saw Japanese monks chanting monosyllabically, and he liked it. So we chant certain chants monosyllabically. We chant this one, 
If we do the Heart Sutra, it's done monosyllabically. Great Vajra, Dara, Tila, Naro, Marpa. And in fact, it's a lot easier when you're in a group because there's a drummer and he's going, Great Vajra, Dara, Tila, Naro, Marpa. And you're just following along with the drum beat. Um, also, the Heart Sutra itself, uh, probably the most chant, one of the most chanted sutras in all of Buddhism, uh, is chanted monosyllabically by the Japanese, and Trung Rinpoche had us do it. And there are some protector chants that are done monosyllabically. Now, when you get to the Vajrayana and you become a Vajrayana practitioner and you chant these chants, you don't do it monosyllabically. He wanted these um, tantric practitioners, two people who are doing tantric practice, to use a more traditional Tibetan style. But us non-tantric practitioners, we do it this particular one monosyllabically. Vajradhar is the primordial Buddha. He's the first figure in the lineage, as I've said. Um, from is right below him is Tilo, that's Tilopa. And uh, he was the guy who with the fish. And then Naropa, who was a great scholar, who gave up his scholarly post at the great university of Nalanda to follow Tilopa and achieve enlightenment. He went through many ordeals. Um, Marpa, and we, we perhaps will read these lives. Marpa, the translator who came from Tibet and received teachings from Naropa and a few others and went through many ordeals. <laughs> There's some wonderful stories. Marpa comes on his second visit and Naropa won't see him. And he sends him a message, says, I'm not going to talk to you. There's another guy you got to go see. His name is Kukuripa. So Marpa says, okay, and he goes to find Kukuripa and he finds that Kukuripa lives on an island in the middle of a lake of poison. The lake is poisonous. So somehow he gets across this lake and then he finds that the whole island is inhabited by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dogs, mean, nasty dogs. <laughs> and he has to make his way through this to get to Kukuripa and he receives teachings from him. So we've got uh, Gampopa, uh, who I already talked about, who's the student of Milarepa. Milarepa, you can see Milarepa if you look at Peter Goldfarb's, um, uh, you know, square uh, in uh, Zoom. There is a tanka of Milarepa behind Peter on the wall, and he's your screen, only... your screen oh. share is your screen share is still up, by the way. Oh, you so say you can't see it? sure well you can always pin peter if you click on the th three dots and then the menu comes down and you click pin suddenly um there you go and that's millarepa uh the cotton clad he's called and he's always depicted as being green although he looks more blue here in this picture uh, because at one point he had no food and he just ate nettles uh, made nettle soup, and he turned green. <laughs> so he's always depicted as being green. Okay, I'm going to put this back on. Can you see the share, this screen now? I'm sharing. Good. Um, so we've got Gampopa, uh, Milarepa, Lord of Dharma Gampopa. That was his student who became a monk who was a monk, and really established the Kagyu uh, lineage as a monastic lineage. And then he had uh, three students, Kampopa, um, who are all very colorful. Uh, they were, at one point, they were having a tantric feast, and you drink liquor at tantric feasts, and they all got drunk. And the master of discipline got pissed off and threw them out, told them they had to leave the monastery. And in the morning, Gampopa woke up and saw them walking down the trail, down the mountain. And he was furious and he called his master of discipline and made him bring them back. Um, and in fact, one of them uh, became the first Karmapa. Karmapa is the head of the Kagyu sect. And uh, he's number one Karmapa. His name was Knower of the Three Times. So um, the omniscient, he says, knower of the three times. There it is. That's the first Karmapa. His name literally was Tusum Kenpa, which means knower of the three times in Tibetan. Holders of the four great and eight lesser lineages. Now the Kagyu lineage fractured over time into 
greater in, uh, in a number of different schools, as always happens after a teacher dies. And these are the names of them, Drigum, Taklam, Salpa, these three glorious Drukpa, and so on. Masters of the profound path of Mahamudra. Mahamudra, which we'll come to at some point, are the highest teachings in the Kagyu lineage. It means great symbol, Mahamudra. They're very colorful and they're very beautiful. Incomparable protectors of beings, the Dakpo Kagyu, it's the Kagyu sect of the region of Dakpo. I supplicate you, the Kagyu gurus, I hold your lineage. Grant your blessings so that I will follow your example and get enlightened. Renunciation is the foot of meditation, as is taught. To this meditator who is not attached to food and wealth. And that's the key. This doesn't mean that you have to starve yourself or live in penury. It means that you're not driven by the desire for food and wealth, which will enslave your mind. Who cuts the ties to this life. You still eat, you still dress, you still celebrate this life with good meals that you give to other people with beautiful clothes that you beautify the world with. Grant your blessings so that I have no desire for honor and gain. This is talking about living in the in the realm of or the space of awareness. Devotion is the head of meditation as is taught. The guru opens the gate to the treasury of oral instructions. These teachings have to be communicated orally from one person to the next. That's the way the lineage is passed. And they have to be, as Trimpa Rinpoche said, eaten and consumed like fresh bread, hot out of the oven. Who cuts the, he says, um, the guru opens the gate to the treasury of oral instructions. You can't get it from books. To this meditator who continually supplicates the guru, grant your blessings so that genuine devotion is born in me. And what genuine devotion is, is a whole object in itself. But basically what it means is, uh, number one, humility, that you're not arrogant. Number two, gratitude and appreciation for the teachings. And above all, the ultimate meaning of devotion is the ability to come present to this world and to everything, the six knowables that arise in us clearly without any kind of manipulation. That is the truest meaning of devotion. Awareness is the body of meditation as is taught. Whatever arises is fresh. It's right now. The essence of realization. This is it. It's only here in the present. To this meditator who rests simply without altering it, it's utterly effortless. Grant your blessings so that my meditation is free from conception, from purpose, from planning, from any kind of self-aggrandizement. The essence of thought is dharmakaya as is taught. Nothing whatever but everything arises from it. And that's another teaching which we don't have time for today. This is the three bodies of the Buddha. And I've talked about it before. And uh, this is the three bodies are the Dharmakaya, um, which is mentioned here. The second body is the Sambhogakaya, which is the body of enjoyment, it's usually translated. And the third body is the Nirmanakaya, which is the body of compassion. Nothing whatever, but everything arises from it. It's because it's the same thing. Nothing exists, and yet everything appears. Everything appears, and yet nothing has any existence. So nothing, whatever, but everything arises from it, this constant display. To this meditator who arises in unceasing play, that means you're in constant engagement and interaction with the world, and it's a constant dance. They call, The word in Tibetan is ropa, which literally is usually translated as play, like you're playing. Grant your blessings so that I realize the inseparability of samsara and nirvana. When we first come to the path, we feel I'm confused, I'm unhappy, I'm miserable. I want to get to nirvana where everything's going to feel good. And what this is saying is 
they meet in the same place, which is awareness. Through all my births, may I not be separated from the perfect guru. The perfect guru is the teachings that bring us to this awakening, awakening from this world of I and other into the real world, which only lives in the present and is full, full of beauty, vividness, and color. And so enjoy the splendor of Dharma, perfecting the virtues of the paths and boomies. These are the stages of the path. There are the 10 boomies, which are define the Mahayana path, which we're going to, and the five stages, which we've talked about a little bit already. May I speedily attain the state of Vajradhara, the primordial Buddha. I'm going to say a little bit, how are we doing on time? Whoa, we're getting late. So I'll just say a little bit about this dedicating the offering. Because it came up the other day, someone asked, if we're not attached to food and wealth, and we're giving up that kind of attachment, why are we asking for long life, freedom from disease, glory, fame, good fortune, and all great and vast enjoyments? <laughs> Sounds like the complete reverse. Grant us the siddhis, the powers of the pacifying and enriching actions and so on. Now, what this is a reference to is an enlightened person, a Buddha, brings other beings to enlightenment in four ways. These are called the four actions. The word is karma in Sanskrit, four karmas. And they are pacifying, enriching, magnetizing, and destroying. And these are the four actions, and that's what this is a reference to. Grant us the cities of the pacifying and enriching actions and so on, meaning give us the power to help other people get enlightened. Samaya holders, Samaya is the oath that you take in the Vajrayana of obedience to the guru and loyalty to the teachings. It's an oath, literally an oath. Samaya holders guard us, support us with all the cities, which we've already talked about. May there be no untimely death, illness, duns, or obstructing spirits for us. And what that's saying is, we're devoted to the Dharma. Don't let there be any obstacles to us spreading the Dharma and living in, the, in a Dharmic way. May we have no nightmares, ill omens, or bad dealings. Same thing. May the world enjoy peace, have good harvests, abundant grain, expansion of dharma, and glorious auspiciousness. May it be a wonderful platform for sentient beings to become enlightened. Accomplish whatever mind desires. It's all the same thing. And I think I'm going to, since we're already at 6.45, um, leave the dedication of merit it's more, a, the only, there's only one word in here that really is uh, somewhat problematic, and that's omniscience. And what omniscience really means here is complete lucid awareness, not being lost in dream. When you're lost in a dream, even the slightest one, it blocks, it limits you, it traps you in its assumptions. And when we begin to come back out of dream into this total awareness in the present moment, we can become awake and aware to everything. And that is what is meant by this. It, literally, the word in Tibetan is to know all. Know all that's happening, everything, as it arises here. And we won't commit acts of wrongdoing, which are self-aggrandizing. And while we are, will be born, go old, get sick and die, that's inevitable. We don't have to be suffering through it. There's so many stories of great teachers dying cheerfully. So many stories. From the ocean of samsara, confusion, unhappiness, may I free all beings. And then this I've talked about before. This is the Shambhala teachings, the golden sun of the great east. The Rigdon is sort of the ruler of the Shambhala world and is the symbol of enlightenment. May the lotus garden 
of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. And what that means is it's not like you're going to be, people are going to start sending you letters saying you're a really terrific person or you're going to get awards. What it's talking about is the beauty and the splendor of this world as it arises around us all the time. That's the profound, brilliant glory here. And I'm not making this up. This is right out of the teachings. So we could have a discussion. That was a lot, as it turned out. And we didn't even do any protector chants, which are the most difficult of all. So I'll get rid of this. I'm going to, oh, I've still got Peter pinned, I think. Okay. Comments, questions, whatever you like. And for those of you who wanted this, a bit of an explanation of the, why we chant, I hope this was helpful. So, uh, John? Yes. Where yes, Judy. Judy, okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, are, the question that I have is, are we invoking the spirit of these teachers? Is that what it is? Is it assumed that there's an energy of them available in the world or um, uh, invoking the memory of their being enlightened teachers? How, how does that go? That's a terrific question. It, it's something I left out. The more we do these chants, it's like we're creating an aroma in the, in our environment and every time we come back to them we smell it again it's the smell of the dharma it pervades us and doing the chants creates that so the chants act as a reminder and they bring us back into the teachings just doing the chants not only that um And I'll leave it there. So the chants create this environment. Also, I won't leave it there. It's kind of like uh, Pavlov's dogs. When we do these things regularly and then sit and bring our minds back into the present, more and more as we just sit down and take the posture of meditation, and then as we do the chants, it brings us back into the present moment. It's a reminder. It, it, our minds come back. They are, get conditioned to it. It's like a trigger. So on the one hand, we're steeping ourselves in the aroma of the Dharma and these people's lives contain that. If we're talking about lineage figures and also the very fact of sitting down in a regular fashion and doing these chants brings you back into awareness and into meditation and helps progress along the path. And this is not my idea. This is in the teachings. Okay. So we're not calling upon um, an energy of them that is I don't know. External. Ex external in the world. It's none of that. No, we are not. Um, although we're using language, symbolic language. You know, if you come to the Sadhana of Mahamudra, and there are people here who know it, there's a line in there, there are many lines. Belief in an external deity has deceived us and led us astray. That's a quote from the Sadhana of Mahamudra. Because none of this is external. It's not an I other proposition. It's here, it's now, it's in the environment. It's not in me as opposed to being out there. It's not out there as opposed to being in, in me. It's everywhere. If we have the eyes 
to see if we wake up to it. These teachings are ultimately non-dual, but language is dual and we have to put it in dualistic terms. And so I will give you another example of this. The very first book that ever came out of Trungpa Rinpoche's teachings was called Meditation in Action. It was done in England. He always felt it was a little, uh, you know, he said that the, the Brits were so uh, straight laced and stiff that it made him very straight laced and stiff. And he didn't feel as loose as he did with Americans. He loved Americans and all these hippies who were showing up and, you know, <laughs> doing all kinds of outrageous stuff. And it allowed him to loosen up when he felt that people were getting it and that they were loose minded. But anyhow, there's a wonderful chapter in Meditation in Action about the relationship with the guru. And what he says is that the guru is showing you what you already have inside you. But you feel that the guru is giving you a gift from outside. It's giving you something you didn't have. And he said, that's very healthy because it produces gratitude in the student. And gratitude, at least in the beginning, is a great slayer of ego. Hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. John, I have a question. Okay, Dan. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, this is, I, it's semantics, but I think it, it means something or it kind of takes on a different feeling. In the dedication of merit, merit um, that I've done in the past and do when, I, when I'm doing teachings with uh, Soaking Rinpoche from the Neem, he's in the Nima sect, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I'm just trying to pull it up here so I get it right. Instead of the way we do it, which is may I free all beings, mm -hmm. his line about in his uh, lineages, his sect's uh, line is may all, from the, from the ocean of samsara with its stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, may all sentient beings be freed as opposed to may I free all. And there seems to be yeah. a, a difference it, in both ways in terms of you're the one who's doing this, but not for your own benefit, you're doing it so to free. And as opposed to just the more passive voice with that, whatever that, I don't know, does it mean anything to you? <laughs> yeah. It does I think your your interpretation is excellent, yes. and um, you have to understand that the, in the Tibetan um, things are much vaguer than in English. Uh, it's kind of like uh, in ancient Chinese. Um, there is a very abbreviated language, real, uh, as opposed to uh, English. English is highly inflected. That means that um, there are many ways to say something and define the meaning very, very, very precisely. As opposed to um, Chinese and Tibetan are at the other end of the linguistic scale in terms of inflection. And they have much less inflection, which leaves it much more open mm -hmm. to interpretation. My mm -hmm. guess is that in that sentence, if I were to look at the Tibetan, there's probably no pronoun. Right. And so it's up to the translator to figure out a way to work with that and put it into English where we need pronouns to make the English work. So I like that version of it that, that you just read. I think that's a very creative. Can yeah. you read it again? Sure. I, I'll just read the whole thing quickly. By this merit, may, um, may omniscience be attained and may the adversary kleshas be conquered from the oceans of samsara with, with its stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. May all sentient beings be freed. That's terrific. Yeah. Send it to, could you send it to me? Maybe we'll sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And use, use it for our chant in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're Kagyu Nyingma here. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, I, I know it's, you know, it's the same uh, intention, but yeah. 
Yeah, I like the, you know, I guess I do like the passive voice better, if that's what you call it. If that's I'm, I'm not sure about that myself. Mm -hmm. I like the aspirational nature of right. the I become a bodhisattva, basically, and free all beings. Yeah, there's more. It, that's what I was saying. I can go both ways on that, too. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, yeah. it brought up an interesting point that, you know, whenever you translate anything, the product of the translation, the translation itself is new. It's a new document. It's not what was originally translated because language is right. so different, especially languages like English, which is highly inflected, as opposed to Tibetan or Chinese, which are very, very uninflected. Um, and so translation becomes the act of creating a new product. All right. Other questions, comments? Um. John, Christy. I, I just had a question about um, the Rigdon's, Rigdon's wisdom. I know you gave a, a talk on the Rigdon um, that, and I missed it. And I, I wondered, I don't know if you have it. Uh, did you record that session or maybe we could um, do another? I'd, I'd love to know more about the Rigdon's wisdom or what that, what the meaning of that is. Um, okay. Just... Well, the, Rig <laughs> the Rigdon's are or you can just tell, yeah, just say the imperial more. rulers of the world. And the idea is that um, um, Shambhala existed mm -hmm. on this planet at one time, but everybody got enlightened. In fact, the Buddha visited Shambhala, and supposedly the king at the time uh, asked him for teachings. And he said to the Buddha, look, we're not going to become monks. I'm a king. My courtiers, you know, they're not going to become monastics. Um, can you give us a teaching that's suitable for lay people? And what the Buddha gave them was probably the oldest of all the tantras. Remember I talked to you about tantras, they're these cryptic, very, very dense uh, and powerful texts. And he gave them the Kala Chakra Tantra, which is Kala Chakra means wheel of time Tantra. And everybody ultimately got enlightened in Shambhala. And at some point they say, Shambhala rose from this earth and now it lives in some demimond, you know, like a, 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 an ethereal realm. But the prediction is that right now we're going downhill civilization. And it's going to get worse and worse for about the next three or four hundred years. And, at, and meanwhile, Shambhala is up there with its Rigdon kings presiding over this enlightened realm and representing the ringed and kings, the ultimate principle of enlightenment. And here's the prediction just for your pleasure, is that in about 400 years, we're now in the reign, I think it's of the 22nd Rigdon. There have been 22. Each of them lives, a lot of them live for about 100 years and reign for longer than, I mean, reign for about 100 years and live for much longer than that. Um, and we're in the reign of the 22nd, I think. Somewhere around the reign of the 25th, there's going to be a huge cosmic war or an earthly war on this planet between the forces of good and evil. And at that point, the king of Shambhala is going to lead the forces of good in this cataclysmic battle and defeat the forces of evil. And after that, there will be a period of uh, sanity and uh, prosperity and happiness and dharma on earth for about a thousand years. This is the myth. If you want to see something really wonderful about it, there is a fellow named Ian Baker, same last name as me. First name is Ian. I've told this to people and I know there are a number of people who've seen this. Ian, um, he, um, he, he, he went to uh, Nepal years and years ago he was one of those people who goes over to teach American students who are going over there on a year abroad. And he was their teacher. And one day he wandered off, he was on vacation, I guess, and he wandered off into the Himalayas for a trek. And he met a yogi and became a Buddhist and then practiced. And he, what he met, the guy he met, this came out much later, was one of the greatest 
Dzogchen masters of his lifetime. His name was Chatro Rinpoche, and Ian became his student. He doesn't say this in his book. He doesn't tell you this. Uh, I figured it out later. And actually, he used to live just where I, he was born and lived where I was living in Westchester, up in uh, Bedford, and we met. So he was practicing, and he learned about a thing called the Bayul. This is very similar to Shambhala, and maybe it's the same thing. The Bayul is a secret land, and it's guarded. You can't get into it um, unless the, the, the journey into it is both a spiritual one, you have to practice, and a physical one. You have to go there physically and ge geographically. And there are four entrances to the Bayul. And Ian um, set out on an adventure to try and find it and get into the Bayul. Um, and that's a story. He wrote a book called The Heart of the World. But what I really am telling you about is that he discusses this on YouTube. And there is this terrific film in which he shows photographs and pictures and tells the story in a more marvelous way. I really recommend it. I think you, you very much enjoy it. Um, it's on, if you go to YouTube and search out Ian Baker um, and the um, Heart of the World, perhaps, because what he's doing, you should see, he rewrote his book. And then he did this video about it to help sell it. The book, I guess. This is what it, or it's about the book, anyhow. And uh, so it's, I think the video is still called The Heart of the World. And now there's a new version of it, which I think is much better than the one that I read many years ago. That's what I hear. We're running over time, John. We are. Sorry. If you want to talk more, we have a discussion group tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put the chance up, dedication of merit. And that's all do it. I'm going to mute all. Meg? John, mute yourself. Thanks. Um, we'll close by dedicating the merit earned by our practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Next time, John, you got to talk about the difference between those two stanzas. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you everybody. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Bye. Bye. Thank you for yeah. doing that. Thanks. Bye. 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 I really enjoyed Bye. that. Bye. 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 Who really enjoyed it? Who were <laughs> I did, but I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I was thinking the same thing. I hope, I hope it served its purpose. There were people who really wanted to hear about the chance. It's kind of right. bumbling, isn't it? I think when I when I hear them now, I'll just be able to contemplate it a little bit differently. You know, it hit me a little differently. So I'm excited about that. Thank you. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. But John, I just sent you the whole Pundarika chant book. Oh, thanks. Include, including the dedication of merit. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah, enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have a relationship with Sukhni Rinpoche. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah. Me, he he me was too. the teacher I listened to after Trimble Rinpoche. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's really wonderful. He's. He is. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. Yeah. I wish I had. Yeah, 
I wish I'd had the opportunity to, you know, to <laughs> learn from Trungpa Rinpoche when he was alive, but, you know. He, yeah, yeah I, I wish he was alive. Like, but, yeah, but, it, you know, it feels very alive to me. And I, you know, I watch him on YouTube or whatever. And it's, uh, his presence is so, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, he's really an incredible presence, even in after death, right? Yeah, for me, it just comes through. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Anyway, man. thank you so much, John. Thanks. Oh, pleasure, John. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. See you tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Oh, wonderful. Really, really interesting. Really, <laughs> interesting. I it was going to be that interesting. And you yeah. know, well, I've said those things so many times. You know. Yeah. So no, fascinating. Fascinating. It is, isn't it? Our lineage yeah. is terrific. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, thank you. Okay. Bye, Peter. Good night. Good night.